Welcome everybody to this year's WTM virtual session on aviation. I'm John Strickland and I'm delighted to be speaking to you today from the floor of WTM 21, a live event, first time in two years, and very pleased to welcome as my guest today, Johan Lundgren, CEO of EasyJet. Welcome, Johan. And how's it, have you been fighting with WTM yourself this year? Has it been good to be back? Well, I just got here. Okay. You know, we had a quick conversation before we started this interview as well. And I, I must say that I can see that it's, uh, it, it's fantastic that it's back, but it is a little bit calmer, a little bit slower, and probably a little bit less people than, uh, uh, than pre-pandemic. But that's what you would expect. Well, let's get to the meat of the issue then, Yo. And I mean, the, the business overall has been challenged now for nearly two years. It's hard to believe that we're well up towards the second anniversary of this COVID pandemic. Tell us how it's been for EasyJet. Your results are coming out shortly. You've already briefed the markets to expect a very substantial loss, which is not untypical of the industry as a whole. What have you been doing and how have you been navigating the crisis over these recent months? Yeah, so basically I think it's important to put it in the context on actually that we came into this as one of the strongest airlines in, in Europe. And we really set out, you know, at the very you know, early phase of the crisis to, to, to do three things. And those are the three things that we've been focusing on as we have been going through the, the, uh, the, 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 the phase of the pandemic as we now come into recovery. One is to make sure that we have enough liquidity. Uh, one is to make sure that we had a, a controlled cash burn and that we were also uh, making uh, every um, type of decision we could to get as efficient as we possibly could coming out of this crisis. And the third part with this was focusing on the recovery. That means that we wanted to set up the company that in, in, in some cases we're actually coming out of it being a stronger airline than we were coming into it. We've been digitalizing the business to, to a larger extent than we were coming into this, giving the customers the option to self-service as an example. And as part of that recovery was also then to adapt the fleet order that we had. So we didn't take any deliveries of aircraft in, in the previous year. But as we're now coming into this year and the recovery, that type of uh, those deliveries are now starting to come back into the fleet again. So it's really about making sure that we get liquidity, the cash, then controlling the cash burn, the cost, and then setting ourselves up for the recovery. And that's been you know, something that has been extraordinarily challenging to do. But I think when you look at it, we got all the big decisions right. You don't go through a situation like that where you get everything right. But the big decisions we've taken with the information we had at that point in time still proves to be the right one. So we can't wait to start you know, the, the recovery coming back in, the, in a way where we can start competing now on the level playing field. And, and how was it to manage all this day to day, Yo? Because I, I asked a similar question to Alex Cruz, who was leading British Airways as this, as this pandemic bit. You know, both you and he are, are experienced men in the industry, but none of us have seen any crisis remotely like this. There's no kind of a, a textbook or playbook as to what you should do if a, a pandemic of this magnitude hits. Just give us a flavor on what it's been like at Hangar 89 or indeed at virtual, virtual work away from the Hangar to manage this. It, it hit, what did you do next? The single biggest challenge and, and the thing that I personally found uh, the most draining and, and, and difficult throughout this whole thing has been to do it in a lockdown where you can't meet and engage with people. Because I mean, you have the crisis in itself, but you know, we, I've, I've been over 30 years in this industry, mm -hmm. and we, we've had to deal with, you know, the, everything from the Kuwait War to the 9/11 to the global financial crisis. You got the tsunamis, you got all of that, the ash clouds. But actually, having to do a crisis of this proportion, of this dimension, with the additional disadvantage, you actually can't engage and meet and see people in the same way you've been doing it. You've been doing it over Teams and Zoom calls and whatever have you. And it's just not, it's just not efficient when it comes on to you know, discussions and decisions you need to take. Um, you know, and also from a well-being point of view, you know, connecting with people in your organization, it's just not the same thing that as you can meet with them. So I found that personally the most difficult thing. Um, and then you of course had the crisis itself, but we, we can deal with crisis. You know, we're set up to deal with crisis. We're hopefully equipped to deal with crisis. Uh, we got the experience to do that. I'm, I'm very, you know, privileged and fortunate with Eastia for that. But to do that in lockdown, mm -hmm. um, being at home and doing it on Teams calls, I think that's been the most difficult part. But if we think compared to previous crises, and you know, Iarta has indicated this uh, by far has been the biggest the industry's ever faced. It way outshines, if that's uh, not an inappropriate way to describe it, all previous crises. You were locked down at home. Luckily, we had the technology to work. But 
we thought possibly this, this was going to be something that had an impact for maybe a few weeks or a few months last year. Here we are, 20 plus months in. How on earth do you manage an airline like that? How, how can you do it when you have no certainty? And all the normal history that you would use for planning your pricing, planning your capacity, just effectively goes in my waste bin. Yeah, so a, a couple of key things. One, you need to have the flexibility to cope with, with, with the changes you're going to see. But we also said early, we put it into the context within the organization. I talked in, internally about to say that, look, there, there will be phases of, of, of this crisis that, that are, are three. One, you're going to have a survival phase. This is quite frankly that, you know, at the time we were, you remember, we were grounded for 11 mm -hmm. weeks. And we didn't know when that was going to start to, to recover and when we are going to get back. So there will be a, a, a phase for the whole of the industry that is about survival. Then you have a phase of recovery, which is what we're into right now. And then you're going to have a phase of, of growth for the whole of the sector. So you put it into perspective to say, look, this is what's going to happen. We can't tell you exactly when you're going to go from one phase to another. But, so therefore, you need to have the flexibility to cope with it within all of these three phases. And that's where we put a lot of focus also to make sure that that flexibility was in there, but also to take the opportunity to strengthen the company, you know, from day one on the things that we wanted to do as we come out of this. We always said, and, and it's been important for me when, when you have to make a lot of really difficult and challenging decisions, as many people have done, is that take the decision with a view to say you won't regret it looking back three to five years from now mm -hmm. with the information you had available. That's everything that you can be asking of yourself and the team to right. do. And I, I think uh, so far we, we got the big ones right and I, I just can't wait to start competing again on a level playing field. And I say level playing field because mm -hmm. this is one of the things that is important to note that you know the recovery isn't evenly spread here even in Europe. If you're looking at the restrictions mm -hmm. You know, UK still have the restrictions on, on the, doing the lateral flow test on, on day two. And it just, you know, uh, just recently removed the, 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 uh, the restrictions of, of uh, the test coming in. Now, there have been none of these tests, uh, you know, outside the UK in Europe since 1st of July. Mm -hmm. So, of course, the recovery has been uneven uh, for not very good reasons, by the way. But, but, you know, that also means that you have to adapt yourself to that situation. Well, if we look at low-cost airlines, Johan, I mean, you know, they are the leaders. They're the ones who've navigated this crisis so far, most successfully, and seen the most response from the market in terms of traffic. But you, as EasyJet, are lagging behind what we see with Ryanair and Wizz, if we see these as the three leading companies, of course, in Europe. Uh, there were some Euro control figures out uh, just recently. They take a snapshot of flying activity in recent weeks, and they show EasyJet being down maybe still about 50% compared to 2019 in recent weeks of operation, while Wiz is a little bit up, Ryanair's about on a par for where they were. Why is it that difference? Does that reflect more caution on behalf of EasyJet, or does it tie in to an extent of what you're saying about the, the distribution of this recovery or difference in government approach? You know, we run, don't run this business on traffic numbers. We, we flew in Q3 17% of mm -hmm. 2019 capacity. We scaled that up to 58% in Q4. Why? Because when you're in a situation like that, that has been loss making for the whole of the industry, including everyone you've been talking about, mm -hmm. you want to make sure that the flying that you are adding on, particularly when there's no requirement to fill slots, are generating a positive contribution for the company. Mm -hmm. It'd be the easiest thing in the world, John, to just put on capacity and flights and trying to win a stupid game or some market share where actually there is no market mm -hmm. and it doesn't matter because the restrictions are in place and you don't and you have the slot waiver so what is important is to make sure that you limit the cash burn that you have throughout this period and you set yourself up and can grow when the full recovery and the restrictions are being unwinded the other point is also that look there's no secret we uk largest airline we are most exposed to the country who has the most restrictions when it's come to travel and, and that has clearly had an effect on, on the recovery as well. But you know, if you're looking at the result we had in, in Q4, generating 40 million operating cash and, and also had a, you know, a, a sharp drop in the losses in Q4 and we're scaling up here in, in, in the, um, you know, uh, our Q1, which is October, November, December for ourselves as well. And, 
and we feel very positive about that. And that is to set ourselves up also to make sure that when the restrictions are, we believe, finally removed also from the UK, we're going to go into very, very different summer in 22. And well, most of the restrictions are gone. I was going to ask you exactly that. Does that yeah. make you feel more bullish about next summer? Or will we see the same caution continue? Let's assume the restrictions are gone. Does that mean it's more likely there's going to be a big bounce back by EGJ yeah. in terms of capacity Absolutely. and results? Remember the numbers I told you. We flew 17% mm. to 2019's capacity in Q3, 58% in Q4, and we guided up to 70% here in Q1. You will not see an airline in Europe who has had that type of acceleration of capacity. So why did we only fly 17%? Because we only flew what generated positive contribution. Mm -hmm. And I believe in those quarters, the two other low-cost airlines you mentioned, they both increased their losses, and right. we reduced our losses on a year-on-year -year basis. So that seems absolutely sensible for me. There is no point throwing out the capacities out there where you don't need to feel slots and it doesn't make and generate any contribution to you as a company. Now you mentioned on the one hand uh, there with cash conservation, you've also just had a, a substantial rights issue recently, raising I think a little over a billion uh, UK pounds yeah, in, in cash for the business. A couple of points on that. When you announced you were going to do that rights issue, you also revealed there'd been a, a, a significant uh, takeover bid for you, an all share takeover bid. You haven't said who it was. The most likely protagonist, which I can say, you know, people are muting it would have been Wizz Air. They haven't said either. Let's imagine it was Wizz Air. That was rebuffed. You've raised some cash. You're still mooted as being a takeover target for the future. Uh, I asked Michael O'Leary, who did he think he, he gave me nearly everybody in the industry, IAG, Lufthansa, Air France KLM, and of course, uh, Wizz Air. He saw them all as being possible who done it candidates to buy EasyJet. Is that something that gives you sleep, sleepless nights? Is it a possibility? How do you manage your business with that in mind for the future? No, absolutely no sleepless nights than that. Look, this is no secret to anybody. EasyJet holds more slot positions in the world than any other airline. Of course, this is an attractive airline. It has a fantastic brand. You know, people will give the left arm for the position we have at the primary airport. And it's not only that we have more slots than anybody else in, 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 in the world. For our European operation as well. It's also the, the best slots. It's the most profitable, most attractive, most in demand slots that is in there. And these things happen. We had to, we had an approach, as you said, and we had to put the bid into the prospectus as we were doing rights issue because it is of significant support to inform the shareholders about it as well. But if, if that proposal would have come, you know, two, three, four weeks earlier, and, uh, and uh, the board had a very close look at that and evaluated it carefully and unanimously turned it down. Um, it would not be in that perspective and that would be the end of the story. So I, I think it's very, very little drama about that at all. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm, um, there was a question that was given to another competitor, say, are you looking at EasyJet? And he said, well, EasyJet is on the radar. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you know, all airlines, are my radar as well. That's what you have to do as a CEO. You have to evaluate what airlines are doing and, and what could create an opportunity for you as well. But I, I'm, uh, to your point, you know, I'm losing zero sleep on these type mm -hmm. of things. Well, I mean, in particular, and we're not against. Can I say we're not against M&A? Mm -hmm. We're not against transaction, but they have to be deliverable, and they have to generate the value for the shareholders. Yeah. And this didn't even come close. I mean, if we think about some of your positions, as you said, number one, number two positions at slot constrained airports, your biggest base by far is Gatwick Airport. And that one I find fascinating because the airport has suffered badly. You know, it's seen most of its customers shrink maybe to non-existence and with no intention to return in some cases. You've added a few aircraft in. Uh, Wizz Air has made it clear that it would love to come in with large numbers of aircraft to Gatwick. British Airways, a current customer, has been wrestling with its future there, which seemingly may be resolved now, so they have the right cost base to run their primarily short haul leisure operation. And surely you could uh, double your fleet at Gatwick. You could use some of the proceeds of this right issue if slots were available to, to really strengthen your position there and exploit more from that market and possibly in other mainstream European airports. Do you have like a portfolio with that kind of idea in mind? Have you got sort of a pecking yes. order? So, so, and, and actually, it's, it's, uh, it goes without saying that, you know, when, when, when there is any bid coming in, the board evaluates that, you know, against, you know, the, the standalone uh, plan that you have as one thing as well. And we feel extraordinarily confident about the growth plan for EasyJet 
to continue on the successful journey that we've been on. And Gatwick is a good example. I think you find that other airlines have been talking about this, this one, but whilst that have happened, we've taken more slots in there. We've now got 71 aircraft, uh, as an example. And look, it, it will be you know, similar situations also in, in airports really across all of our markets. And one of the reasons why we wanted to do the rights issue with, with the, the size that it was, uh, was partly to help us importers get back to the metrics around the balance sheet strength that we had going into it. One was to make sure that we also had a buffer if the pandemic continued, but one was also to fund future growth, mm -hmm. to make sure that we can fund that growth by, you know, we wouldn't hesitate, for instance, bringing on operating leases, go over and above our, our fleet plan, if that it will take, any commercial makes sense well, to I do so. I wanted to ask you that particular point, Johan, because if we look at the other two low-cost carriers, Wizz Air and Ryanair, they both have big order books. Uh, Wizz Air has said recently they may increase their order book. You also have a big order book, but in relative terms, smaller than the other two. So with what you're just telling me there, you would you would be willing to go beyond that yeah. if you see the opportunity. But, but, but here's, the, here's the thing. We have the same order book coming into this crisis that we have mm -hmm. right now. We have 101 aircraft in order. We got 58 plus 20 on purchase rights and option. That's 179 aircraft in, in, in that package. Nice. And I, I know that you know there were one or two who made a criticism throughout the pandemic. Oh, why do you still have that order book? Why don't you, you know, uh, is that the right thing to do? And now with the same order book that we have, you know, we have one or two say, well, you're not growing fast enough. Mm. We have some of the biggest and the strongest order books that is there. What we did was to make sure that we didn't have to take delivery of aircraft throughout the pandemic. And, you know, this is now what we're starting to do when we're coming into this winter to set ourselves up for the next summer. So I think that the key thing was the flexibility. Now, to your point, would we go outside that order book in order to take positions that might become available through operating leases? Yes, we would. Mm -hmm. If there's a case for it, and, and that, that is definitely something that we're not going to allow ourselves to be constrained if these positions come up. Because it's once in a lifetime you can get you know, space in some of these airports. And will you look at increasing the number of A321 aircraft in the fleet? You're doing that. Will you accelerate that? Because that seems to me to be, a, I hate to use that sort of cliche word, game changer aircraft. We see Wiz exploiting it, many other airlines. It gives you more long range capability should you choose to use it as well. Well, I think it's part of what we've been saying all along, that we're looking to upgauge the, the whole of the fleet. Mm. So that means that we would get rid of more of the 319s then, and then move into the 320 and, and, and the 321. So you're absolutely right on doing that. Uh, I mean, it does make sense also to, to, to some extent that we also keep the flexibility of the smaller aircraft because we can have much more frequencies than, than others can do. Mm. They can't fill the planes on the same type of network that, that we have. That gives efficiencies and that also gives us a presence in the market that you can't do if you're just running three, four you know, flights a day where we would do you know, seven, eight, nine as an example. But absolutely upgaging is part of the strategy. And the type of customers you're flying, and we've, again, we've seen a big recovery in where traffic has been able to fly in leisure travel, people wanting to go on holiday, friends and relations traffic. And you're more focused on business travel, perhaps more so than your immediate peer group, certainly the legacy carriers, the network carriers, also focused on that. Do you see business travel as a challenge for you or an opportunity no, as we move ahead? It's a great opportunity for us. Look, there's a couple of things that, that's happening as we speak, and we said this all along, by the way, you know, that, and, and this is one of the things that it helps in being in the industry for a long time. When you come out of crisis, a couple of things will happen. You're going to see short haul recovery quicker than long haul. You're going to see less year recoveries quicker than, than business travel. People are going to gravitate towards brands that they trust and who gives you value for money. The big thing that sits outside that, and I'm sure we'll come on to that, is about sustainability. Mm -hmm. That's the big thing that is different coming out of this crisis versus the previous crisis. Now, when you're looking at that then within those patterns, you can call it, we're seeing that we continue to take share on the business customer because our business customers is more related into small and medium-sized businesses. They don't have the same type of corporate guidelines and restrictions when it comes to travel as some of the, 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 the major corporations have. And they've been quicker off the mark to get going and get traveling again from the pandemic, mm -hmm. which means that we are helped by that. Uh, we also have a lot of you know, people within business travel that are, are people who physically need to go to place, to power plants. They would be engineers as an example. 
they can't replace it mm -hmm. by Zoom or a team calls. Right. So we've been growing also from, from that aspect. And the reasons why we, we've been strong also, we're seeing now through some service we've done on, on business travel and being a first choice, is because our carbon offsetting scheme that we're doing. Because sustainability is going to matter more, so companies will m make more choices on the companies who has less impact on the environment than others. And clearly, we're doing 100% offsetting all the carbon emissions that we're doing with the highest quality of product that is out there. It's an advantage for ourselves. I mean, as, as we speak, we have you know, the COP26 meeting going on right now. The environment has never been in greater focus, and that's not going to change in any way. We are, as the UK Prime Minister says, one minute to midnight on this issue. And it's a bigger issue than the pandemic. Do you think the industry is doing enough? And do you think, maybe more relevantly, are governments doing enough to help the industry? Because we can't suddenly change from fossil fuels overnight. I mean, hydrogen and electrics, which you're involved in research projects on, are likely or not probably some decades away. What about this partnership or love-hate with governments on this? No, I, I think that the, you know it, it's a very important question. And we always argued that there needs to be funds and there needs to be incentives for companies and industries to move into the transition phase to get on to, in our case, you know, true zero emissions technology. The, the carbon offsetting that we're doing, it's an interim solution. We said that all along before you're getting into what you really want to do, which is true zero emissions technology. We know that hydrogen uh, slash electric in one combination or that will work for short haul airline. We know that, you know, that, that is not a question. The question is how you transition to that and what you do in the, in, in the mean term. I think when you're looking at the hydrogen, clearly we would need to have, make sure that there's enough supply on there. We need to make sure that there's an infrastructure being built around that. Um, sustainable aviation fuel will play a part, particularly for long haul. I, I don't frankly see that as a you know, golden solution, silver line for short haul, because it is essentially a carbon offsetting product. Mm -hmm. It produces the same you know, quality and have the same characteristics as kerosene when you use. It's actually when you grow it, it works like a, right. like a carbon tank, just like a carbon offsetting project would do. So I would think that we would, we would like to see more of the, the, the sustainable aviation fuel being directed towards the long haul airlines and then focus a lot on the transition on, on hydrogen capacities than for the short haul and for the medium haul. Um, I, but but uh, look, I'm also, as you know, I'm chairman for Airlines for Europe. And um, you know, there's been a big commitment within the sector to reach a net zero with the de destination 2050 roadmap that we have. That's been you know verified, you know, from from uh, experts outside the industry as well. So I think we are on a on 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 a track. There's still many 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 things mm -hmm. that needs to happen, but governments also need to support us in making that transition to make sure that, particularly after the pandemic, where funds has been you know, let go outside the, the industry and losses have been accumulated that we don't stop on the journey to get to that zero emissions technology that, that we uh, so much want to do. Well, Jörn, I think the clock is beating us today for the time we have available to talk. There's much, much more to discuss. Maybe just finishing up, would, would you be optimistic that you're going to be sitting here and I can ask you the same questions in a year's time? A fit, healthy business? Or might you be in the hands of somebody else running a business at that oh point? God. <laughs> it, will, it will definitely be the former, not the latter. I can assure you that. that. I, I feel extraordinarily confident right. about the, the, the process we have. And I think when you're looking back at this, what we managed to do, we've taken the right decisions at the right time, and we got most of them and the big important ones right. You can't say that about any, you know, a lot of airlines that is out there. So I'm very pleased and proud of the team. It's been an extraordinary time for the team and they've really stepped up and delivered. So I'm really pleased about that. Now it's time for the more exciting journey as we go through this. Great. Well, let's hope we get through this challenging winter to a more bright summer next year for you and for all of us. Uh, so, Jörn Lundgren, CEO of EasyJet, thank you very much for your time. Look forward to the next time we speak. Hope you enjoyed our discussion there. I think we covered, covered a lot of interesting points and definitely we need to keep our eyes on EasyJet and the industry in the coming months. And hopefully we'll see you again this time next year for a live WTM as well as a virtual session. Thanks very much.